name is Rick Seidel, and I'm the regional sales manager for the Northeast United States uh, for Fight Corporation. Fight Corporation is headquartered in Blue Springs, Missouri, which is just outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and been in business for uh, going on almost uh, 80 years here. So we celebrated our 75th year anniversary in 2020, but have been around for a long time and have expanded our operations globally to where we do have regional headquarter offices around the world and do have distributors and representatives around the world so that we do support projects pretty much anywhere they may need to go uh, here you know, uh, uh, around the world globally here. Our solutions include the, the specific products that we manufacture directly and have subcontract agreements with other manufacturers or uh, suppliers to us, but really the industries that we focus on and the product lines that we focus on are everything from our fire protection solutions, which is what I'm really going to focus on here today, as well as an extensive line of products for explosion protection hazards when we deal with combustible dust, uh, overpressure protection for process and uh, chemical convey lines, as well as pressure activation products. But really what we're going to focus on here today for the purpose of this presentation are our fire protection solutions. So we do have a very broad line of products from everything from fire alarm panels and systems, including voice evacuation, uh, bi-directional amplifiers and emergency responder systems, which I'll touch on briefly in this presentation here, uh, as well as other detection and control lines for everything from intelligent alarm systems and video imaging and flame detection, thermal monitoring, uh, early warning air sampling detection. So we have a lot of options from a detection standpoint. And then of course, our primary reputation in the industry is built on our suppression products which are primarily the clean agent systems uh, and or including CO2 and water mist. So I'm going to touch a little bit upon uh, all of those products just to kind of give you a taste as to what we have and what IPS has direct access to uh, for designing solutions for whatever hazard or customer needs you may come across. So obviously with that range of product lines, it puts us into just about every market you can imagine. And uh, because fires do happen in all these markets, and it's very important to make sure that the end users and the customers can detect upset conditions very quickly and as early in the process as possible to try to avoid any potential devastating outcome from allowing a fire to occur and do devastating damage either in the production or their uh, facilities and or communication and computer room type environments. So a fact of the matter is, especially when it comes to uh, data centers and business continuity, uh, the statistics show us that 50% of companies that suffer a significant fire end up going out of business and closing their doors within two years. And that number actually goes up to about 93% uh, within five years. So fires are extremely damaging and cause a lot of uh, disruption and damage that a lot of companies just are not set up and structured to overcome in the long term. And the main reason why is because of the business disruption that a fire can create. And one of the questions we always ask our customers or, or a topic of the conversation that comes up when we're discussing different options with customers and trying to identify hazards is asking them what would a major business disruption cost your company even if you can put it down to to an hourly basis and whether that's just talking about manufacturing and the lack of product you've been able to put out because some of your production lines may have been damaged or a production facility uh, or in the service sector uh, or even with your IT system, you know, with your uh, data management systems, if those are down for an hour or a day, how much lost production and response time and, and cost and lost revenue and business do you realize? And same thing with production, et cetera. So it, it carries a lot of you know, business disruption can cross the span of many different realms of industry or, or service or manufacturing. And especially when it comes to uh, fire protection or business disruptions from a fire, many folks think they have appropriate fire protection to stop or control a fire, but they don't go the next step and ask themselves, but what happens afterwards? What happens after that fire has been potentially controlled or addressed? Uh, and maybe you saved the building overall and obviously saved your personnel and your occupants, but what about everything else that comes with dealing with the aftermath of a fire condition? Research we've done has shown and uh, publications have, have put out there that the average cost of a data center outage today is about three quarters of a million dollars. So anytime a data center goes out anywhere, if they don't have the appropriate backup systems in place, the complete lost revenue and service and just loss of sales or unrecognized revenue uh, is about three quarters of a million dollars. And so that number there alone is what 
attributes or contributes to some of those uh, staggering statistics of the amount of companies that just cannot survive that sort of downtime, especially from a fire that might occur in their data center. Uh, you know, Amazon.com is obviously very heavily reliant on their website and their IT and their networks being up and running every second of the day. And they estimate that every second that Amazon.com is down, they lose about $1,400. Uh, Google recently reported they had a five minute outage and they figured that their uh, website just being out for five minutes cost them over $500,000 just in five minutes. So that's about $1,600 a second is the estimated revenue. They estimate that they lost just from their website being out for a few minutes. And a couple years ago now this is, but there was a, a fire in one of the cable tunnels, a communication cable tunnel at the Atlanta airport. And the outage was not all that prolonged or long, but it was long enough that it interrupted their services and their capabilities at the Atlanta airport, as, as well as 2000 other flights over the course of three days that would connect through or, or involve the Atlanta airport hub there. They estimate that that cost them about $150 million for that one small little event that they had take place in one of those uh, facilities in those communication tunnels. And so it's not only the actual downtime that occurs from the damage, but how long and how much does it take to get back to business as normal? And that's what we kind of lump into the bucket here of being fire protection solutions for business continuity. And that's really the realm of what FIKE offers through its distributors and through its product offerings. The standard fire protection approach that everyone's uh, obviously very familiar with are sprinkler systems. And sprinklers are, are great for building protection, but there's a bunch of misconceptions associated with sprinkler systems. For example, many folks think that uh, sprinklers will actually extinguish a fire, that they'll protect the entire fa facility, that you can set a sprinkler system off by activating a manual pulse station or a uh, smoke detector going off. And that also that all of the heads go off during a fire, which is what we refer to as the Hollywood effect. You know, several movies and TV shows out there, somebody holds a lighter up to a sprinkler head and all of a sudden every sprinkler in the hallway and the building and the room starts spraying water everywhere. That's just not how sprinklers are designed to uh, work. The facts are the purpose of a sprinkler system is to contain a fire and not necessarily to extinguish. You see it basically generates almost an umbrella cascade of water uh, with the idea being that wherever that heat is the hottest directly underneath the head melts off that head and it starts spraying water all the way around to surround where that hottest element potentially of that heat generation is occurring just to saturate everything around where the fire is actually taking place so it cannot spread so we try to contain the fire to where it may have originated eventually it will extinguish the fire just because there will be so much water in the area uh, it may end up accumulating and flooding over top of the surface of whatever is burning but the main purpose of sprinkler systems is not necessarily to extinguish a fire, but to contain it and prevent its spread to the rest of the facility or the building. So, uh, sprinkler systems provide minimum compliance with the codes. And again, only the affected heads will discharge because each sprinkler head has a fusible or thermal link on the bottom there. And if that head does not melt off because of the heat being hot enough to melt it off under uh, at that specific area, the head's not going to open and water will not come out. So the only way water discharges from a sprinkler head is once that link has melted and fallen off of the head there. And again, it's all based on heat detection. So they are typically going to be the last line of defense. A sprinkler system is not going to go off if you just have smoke emanating from a source. Your smoke detectors will and the alarms will go off to give everybody advanced warning that something's been detected and they should vacate the area. But the only time the head is actually going to start to discharge water is when the, the, the uh, Thermal increase below it is significant enough to melt off the head and allow that pathway to open. And we're talking about significant water discharging uh, from a head when it goes off. So you're going to have significant water and collateral damage to deal with after an activation. And obviously water is electrically conductive. So anytime you have a sprinkler head go off, there is going to be expected a significant business interruption. And this is where the fight product line of offerings comes in to try to eliminate uh, some of those additional disruptions that you obviously would like to try to avoid uh, as much as possible. The aftermath of water, um, you know, this is a picture that was taken by one of our distributors uh, after a sprinkler head went off in a data center. And, you know, a lot of IT managers or data center managers get nervous if you walk into uh, one of their computer rooms with just a even a bottle of water or a cup of coffee on the off chance that you would happen to spill or, or drop it and that water splashes up into the servers and shuts them down. 
let alone the amount of water that would discharge from a sprinkler system, uh, even in a fire event. You can see the water does accumulate. There's a lot of it. And we know that the water that comes out of a sprinkler head, at least initially upon discharge, is usually not the cleanest because there is a phenomenon that will occur in sprinkler pipes uh, with that corrosion and that uh, what's called mic build up inside those steel pipes from the presence of water and oxygen inside those pipes over a prolonged period of time. So not only do the sprinkler pipes potentially risk being uh, reduced as far as the efficiency and the amount of water they can flow through them because of that buildup of uh, that corrosive material over time, but it could also clog up a head and prevent a head from potentially discharging when it needs to. Uh, but the water that does come through is going to contain that and be pretty murky and muddy and and not smell the most pleasant. So there is quite a bit of cleanup that's going to be associated after any sprinkler head uh, ever discharges. The other byproduct or uh, disadvantage of sprinkler systems is they're going to be the last one to act uh, when there is a fire. So if you look at time there on the horizontal axis, you know, you're going to have a significant amount of time that develops by the time a fire has started, uh, even from a smoldering condition, till it releases enough heat to actually activate a sprinkler system. It could be several minutes. The goal of the uh, fike systems and fire extinguishment with clean agents is not just to control a fire like a sprinkler would, uh, but to try to detect very early, activate the clean agent system to extinguish so that the heat release never gets hot enough to set off a sprinkler, and with the properties and the way that clean agent systems work, we want to minimize the aftermath so that there's really very little cleanup or associated downtime just from the fire's uh, reaction system going off. And that's what we're really going to focus on here today is to show you some of those examples uh, and differences on the clean agent systems as to why people prefer them uh, in certain areas. The overall sequence of fire protection obviously is going to be the uh, step one is you have to detect a fire. Uh, then you want to notify folks and alert folks that you that something has been detected. And then step three is determining how you want to react to that fire. So if we look quickly here at the just the step one of detection, there are various types of detection methods available. And ultimately, you're going to choose uh, the right one based upon when you want to detect and be alerted to a potential combustion in your site. If we kind of try to visualize it here in a graph and look at the stages of fire detection, Again, I'm using time, a time lapse there on the horizontal axis from left to right. Uh, you can see that the gray indicates the smoke damage or the, and the buildup of heat in different stages there. And so we've got different areas that we could potentially input detection devices to try to detect something based on how early on and how much smoke and or heat damage do we want to try to avoid by getting that earliest detection. So the first options that we really have in the line there are video imaging detection and air sampling detection uh, by Extralis Vesda. So the video imaging is the first product I'll really take a look at here because it's relatively new uh, to a lot of folks, but ultimately the idea is we are going to use traditional video image feeds uh, from video cameras and we have developed software that can analyze that video stream to look for elements of a fire. And specifically, our detection programs can analyze uh, just constant streaming video looking for very early elements of uh, trace amounts of smoke, flame, reflected light of flame behind obstructions, and motion is also a byproduct of that. Now, obviously, we wouldn't necessarily use motion to uh, trigger a fire event, but the motion detection is a byproduct of those algorithms. So you do get an element of kind of security notification as well when we're using that type of system. And all four of those algorithms are included in the software that we provide in our cameras. And the real neat thing about it, since it is a very programmable and computer based and based on video camera uh, analytics, we can individually enable and adjust basically all of those zones to either focus detection in some areas or completely ignore detection of either element in other areas, uh, adjusting the sensitivity on any field of view, inputting different time delays, really out relay outputs, and on off schedules as to when we want to look for maybe smoke more than flame or vice versa or the most common element of the on off schedules and the easiest way to explain it is if you're trying to monitor video inside of a, a busy area uh, you know where you've got a your first shift comes in from 7 a.m to, to 5 p.m every day obviously you're not going to you're not going to want to detect motion then but on the off time on the off hours when really nobody should be in there that's your easiest time to turn on that motion detection every day from maybe 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. You want to be alerted if somebody's in there because they shouldn't be. That's the security aspect of the system. But you can apply that same logic just based on exactly what the camera is seeing 
over the course of normal business occurring in that area to know when you want to try to really uh, focus on smoke or rule out smoke if smoke and or steam is part of the normal operation uh, in that camera's field of view. We don't want to detect on it when that's part of the normal operation during certain hours or days or parts of the shift, but we can respond to it at other times just based on how we're going to program everything. So very customizable and what the video imaging detection allows many folks to do is to, to achieve very targeted detection in areas that otherwise might be very difficult to address, especially in terms of when you have very large open areas like warehouses or hangars or uh, any vestibule with very high ceilings, trying to detect something that's happening on the floor all the way up at the ceiling introduces a lot of other elements of delay and performance that we can rule out by using video imaging detection because anything in that camera's field of view is fair game uh, that we can look to program to detect. The cameras that we still use today were actually uh, first developed back in the early 2000s. You can tell just by the look of them there. Uh, they're not even a high definition camera. It's a standard definition camera with relatively low uh, resolution and frame rates. Uh, and we are working, we're constantly working to improve this technology and we have a high definition, much more uh, sleeker and smaller unit ready for release here shortly. But this one's the listings and, every, and the performance still are in accordance with what they need to be uh, to meet the intents of all the codes as a uh, smoke and fire detection system. So we do continue to use it here today. And each camera is listed out to 100 feet, uh, but, it's but under our performance-based design guidelines, which is what the codes recommend and require for these systems, we can extend that out to 150 to 200 feet with one camera at a very wide field of view to know that anything that's basically in its field of vision is going to be detected in a timely manner in terms of either smoke or flame. And these cameras uh, will go right back to a uh, video management system. We have a couple different size servers that we provide. And the, our largest one, for example, I think is actually up to 18 terabyte here. Now I'll have to update this slide. Uh, but we can support up to 32 of our cameras and achieve a recorded history from anywhere from one week to several weeks based on the amount of cameras that are on a server. If we have a site or facility that takes more than 30 cameras, uh, that's not a problem. We just put in multiple servers and link them all together to create one large network. We have some pretty complex and complicated networks in a lot of uh, pretty high profile locations around the country and some of which have uh, upwards of 100 to 200 cameras all in the same network. Since it is a camera based system, we can easily achieve remote monitoring over the Internet. So this uh, either can or may not be attached to whatever internal network the customer or the end user has at their site uh, and to where they might have a, a screen or a workstation dedicated just to this system or it can be on their common shared network where anybody at any time could go find a camera and pull the video feed from it to see what that camera is seeing and go into its history and see which uh, what detection events it might have had uh, over the course of the last week or so to see what led up to potentially a fire occurring. And the remote playback of events is very popular as well because when you do have a fire or an alarm is triggered by a camera, even if it's a day or two or a week later, you can go into the system, go back to that specific event, and you can even rewind to 30 seconds, a minute, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever ahead of time and watch the video footage of what led up to that event to help with your root cause analysis or to determine what the failure was that caused your fire. So if we look at some examples as to how these cameras work, this is a smoke emitter test uh, that was done in a plant. So you can see the smoke candle was lit in the bucket there. And in this case, I believe there was a 10 second delay programmed into the camera. So it wanted to consistently and constantly be detecting smoke for 10 seconds before it went into alarm. And you can see as that smoke continues to emanate there from the, uh, the barrel, now the 10 second has lapsed and now the system has outlined that smoke cloud. And once that green uh, outline appears there, that is the relays on the back of the camera triggering uh, response or an alarm signal to the uh, building system. The advantage is again when you've got high ceilings, you can see that smoke still has not made it up to the ceiling. So traditional spot type smoke detectors or beam detectors up at the ceiling uh, would not have gone into alarm. But with our camera system, it's detecting it at the floor and it doesn't wait for that smoke to get to a certain elevation uh, or high enough up before it, it goes into alarm. So it can detect things. Uh, before they would take it that enough time for the, for the smoke to actually go to the detector, it takes the detection to the smoke and to the fire. And again, in, in uh, another example of its advantage, in some very high ceiling areas, 
that smoke may stratify halfway up or three quarters of the way up and maybe never make it all the way up to the deck. With the camera system, we don't need it to. We can track it and trace it and go into alarm uh, regardless of, of how high it has risen in the area. And here's an example in a uh, small private airplane hangar of the camera detecting flame. And here there was no time delay, so you'll see just how quickly once this little sterno lamp is, is uh, lit and the gentleman kind of leaves the field of view, now the camera has already picked it up and recognized that small amount of fire uh, at quite a distance away and would have started triggering alarms to put that system into alarm and start alerting folks to the fact that a fire has been detected in the area. And then with the reflected fire light algorithm, here you can see a fire has been lit behind that stack of boards. And now even though we cannot see the flame directly, the algorithm and the software is looking for that random flicker and reflective patterns on surrounding surfaces and is outlining it with those uh, purple hash marks and would now be triggering folks to realize, hey, I, I don't see smoke, I don't see a visible flame, but this has all the lookings of a fire that is occurring behind a, an obstruction or, or a piece of machinery that's worth someone going to check out and uh, to take a look at. And because it is all video based, uh, this would come right up on a computer monitor somewhere that's running the software. It can also be programmed to send emails uh, to, pro to a program list of recipients. And the email might be a picture or a screenshot of exactly what put the, the camera into alarm uh, to show folks, hey, camera number six uh, went into alarm because we see a reflected uh, firelight. And if it showed you uh, a short clip of this video or even just a picture of what it's seeing, we would be able to recognize right away that, yes, something is happening that we need to go to respond to. So very intelligent, intuitive and flexible uh, to be able to use video camera and video camera type systems to detect fire. Where it becomes very popular is in areas of uh, beam pockets or beam construction in the ceilings. You know, whenever you get into a point where you need to put a sampling point or a smoke detector up in a beam pocket, it gets rather costly from a standpoint of additional material that's needed and conduit and wire and installation, as well as the ongoing cost of ownership. With a camera system, we can alleviate that specifically with that kind of example by putting one camera uh, on the wall that's looking directly under all of those beam pockets and you've now covered every beam pocket with one camera on the wall because anything that's gonna enter that beam pocket will be detected by the camera. And this slide here is just to give an example of how we can program in some of those zones uh, for detection. So very easy to just draw in uh, either squares, rectangles, circles, or any kind of shape you wanna uh, put in there to work in some of your zones or schedules for detecting or ignoring things or different sensitivities. So if we are in some heavily industrial areas where maybe there are some flames that are regularly present or some steam output from some boilers or pieces of machinery, we wouldn't want that to set the camera off every day or shift or however often it happens. So we will program around that uh, just based on what we know happens in the area to make sure that we go into alarm when there is an actual event, but don't get tricked uh, into a regular occurrence setting the system off. So it's a real quick overview of how the camera system works and how we can apply it in some otherwise challenging areas where maybe traditional types of smoke or fire detection might not be the best suited. So that's a product that uh, Fight developed and really has been focusing on for uh, probably the last 20 years or so uh, that you do have access to. As that has evolved over the last couple of years here, we have added on to uh, that with some additional types of detectors and one of which is thermal monitoring and so thermal monitoring is now required uh, in the nfpa 652 code for combustible dust hazards and we're also seeing a lot of popularity and demand for this technology with energy storage systems especially with the the the, rate, the recent occurrence or the recent popularity of energy storage systems for lithium ion batteries uh, the thermal monitoring of those battery racks or uh, those enclosures are becoming very popular because we want to try to detect that thermal runaway or a battery failure very early on in the process uh, before it might start to cascade to additional racks or or uh, assemblies of batteries and and destroy the entire enclosure the goal is we want to pick up those hot spots as soon as we can to cut the power to that rack remove that rack so that the rest of the batteries are unaffected now thermal monitoring in this regard uh, is not yet recognized in the NFPA codes as an acceptable means of fire detection. So you would still need your traditional smoke or heat detectors in place to actually set off any fire alarms, but this thermal monitoring is more of a prevention 
or accessory type system, a supplemental system to your fire protection system, because this will give you very early indication of a potential upset condition occurring. Uh, and it's very programmable as well to different temperatures, uh, relative temperatures or absolute temperatures or difference to ambient rate of rise in different areas. You can get very creative and I, I think put up to 25 different zones of settings into any one thermal monitors field of view to really again try to to narrow down to exactly where your specific areas of concern are in terms of thermal output from any piece of equipment or motor or a bearing on a uh, belt conveyor system or in the lower right there you can see at some uh, trash facilities where they scoop out bulk product you can see there is a hot spot where that loader has lifted out and taken out a pile of product that's invisible to the naked eye and is probably not hot enough to set off a, a, a heat detector uh, there's certainly no flame or smoke present there yet, but that is a smoldering pile underneath that pile of product that we can now uh, identify and maybe send somebody out with a handheld CO2 extinguisher or something to try to uh, reduce that temperature and put out that potential smoldering condition there. So a lot of different applications where we can use that thermal monitoring for detection and enunciation. The flame detectors are a listed fire detection system, and FIKE has a great product line of triple IR and UVIR flame detectors that are used in some very heavily industrial uh, app and big wide open applications and areas as well because of their immunity to false alarms and their quickness to be able to respond to an actual fire event in any given area. And what's really unique about the FIKE detectors are we also build in an HD camera into those detectors. So that camera can or does not have to be connected to a network, but it's built in on board and has its own little onboard memory so that with traditional flame detectors, if it ever went into alarm, uh, it would just trip the contacts on the back and enunciate to the fire alarm panel, but you would never know exactly what set that detector off. And so there was a lot of false alarms or false activations associated with flame detectors in the past because maybe by the time somebody gets out there to where that flame detector is, there's nothing going on. And so you don't know what set that detector off. Well, now, just by having the HD camera built into these units, anytime it goes into alarm, it immediately stores uh, 60 seconds pre-alarm and 30 second post-alarm history of what was on that HD detector. So you can go out at any time and pull up that exact video and play it and see what put that detector into alarm when it happened. So that, that in my opinion, is revolutionary and a great benefit to have from these units. Again, not only to assist in root cause analysis and to determine what failed or happened to initiate the fire, but to show you exactly what it was to set that detector off. And this video here, uh, what you can see is uh, we've got a gentleman. Uh, this is a very heavily industrial environment, obviously. So we've got a gentleman that is grinding up in the front. So there's a constant cascade of sparks going off in the front here. Just beyond him up to the left a little bit, you've got a gentleman who's arc welding. So you've got that weld flare coming off the weld and you've got a big on the top right of the screen, a big open doorway with natural sunlight coming in and reflecting UV and IR and sunlight uh, waves of energy off of various metal surfaces and, and uh, reflective surfaces here. But in the middle of the screen, we've got a gentleman who's going to light a a traditional blowtorch and put an actual flame to a small piece of product at a pretty good distance away. And you'll see when I play the video here that the detectors are uh, ignoring all of those other sources, which aren't fires. But as soon as that gentleman starts to strike his little torch and light a little piece of product on fire, you'll see the screen start to blink where it recognized that as an actual potential fire and triggered an alarm. And then with the onboard HD camera, immediately captured that alarm to video. Uh, to show what it was and to justify the activation. So here he's still working on lighting up his little uh, piece of product there. And as soon as there was enough flame present for that and that energy reached the IR detector, you can see the screen starts to blink and that would be the flame detector now going into alarm because of that fire that was present. So its ability to rule out and ignore false sources of radiation to indicate a fire, but to really trigger or focus on an actual fire event is very impressive with these detectors. And same thing here, another live example of an actual fire that occurred at a, a waste facility where you can see it's a very complicated field of vision with a lot of stuff in the way and you've got moving vehicles constantly coming in and scooping product in. And where you want to focus here is as soon as the loader leaves the screen, look down here in the lower right corner of the screen because it actually is a lithium ion battery uh, that exploded off screen 
and a small amount of it flew into the screen that was on fire. And that as soon as it flies onto the screen there, uh, there it just went. You can see how quickly it, it was for that triple IR detector to find that very small flame in this pretty large area here and to go into alarm and again to capture that video. So just very impressive how these flame detectors work and we see them being applied to many different uh, areas of primary concern for early monitoring. On the other spectrum of the flame detection, again, is smoke detection. And one of our very early warning smoke detection systems, which you, you may already be familiar with, is VESDA. And so instead of having just a real quick overview, instead of having a regular smoke detector up on the ceiling like you, like you would at your home, in your bedroom, and, and throughout your hallways, uh, this is more of an active smoke detection system because we've got a, a main unit hanging on the wall somewhere uh, that's got a small aspirating fan inside of it. And we send pipe networks out to the areas and those piping networks are drilled with engineered size holes so that we can assure exactly ensure control how much air we're pulling from the entire piping network. But we're going to actively bring air from a big area back into our sampling chamber and detect it for very trace amounts of smoke to achieve very early detection. So kind of along the same way as video detection, instead of waiting for smoke to reach a detector and to concentrate to uh, upwards of two and a half or so uh, or two to five percent obscuration, we can bring very trace amounts of smoke from an area back to our detector and achieve much earlier and much more sensitive detection to trigger a, uh, a smoke detection alarm or even a suppression system much earlier on in the process than waiting for that smoke to develop. So. A very wide range of products from very early warning air sampling detection available uh, through Phi Corporation by Extralis, uh, formerly known as VESDA. And one of the neat things about the air sampling system is as we're pulling all that air to our unit, we can also put on those pipelines, uh, on those sampling pipes, gas detection. So in some pretty, uh, again, heavy industrial areas where maybe combustible gases or uh, dangerous or toxic gases may be present that we want to detect if there's ever an upset condition or if levels ever get to areas that might be dangerous for personnel or for operations. While we're pulling the gas in to sample it for smoke, we can also run it through a gas detection uh, cartridge to sample it for potential presence of flammable or toxic gases. So very easy to install on those pipes to be able to get basically two functions out of one unit with both smoke detection and uh, gas detection as well. Another means of fire detection, and I think it's one of the last ones coming up here, is uh, linear heat detection, which is also available. And Fike partners with a company named Protectawire uh, up in the Northeast in the Boston area. And linear heat detection is basically a, while, a wire that can be run in a large area, uh, primarily used in a lot of warehouses or rack storage type facilities. So instead of having to put conduit and wire and boxes for traditional smoke or thermal detectors, uh, in an area, we can run this cable in and around anywhere that we want to monitor. And as soon as the heat increases to any program level, anywhere along that length of cable, it can be detected and put a system into alarm. And basically, all it is uh, is a wire, a two conductor wire with an outer jacket and two uh, conductors on the inside that are coated with some uh, additional polymers that are heat sensitive. And we've got a lot of different ranges of specific temperatures as to where this stuff starts to melt. And all that the system is looking for is a short circuit along the cable, meaning the polymers have melted off and now those two conductors are exposed and touching each other, basically closing the loop, closing the contacts to, to initiate or, or indicate we've had a detection. And one of the real neat things about uh, the advancement the advancements in this technology is something called confirmed temperature indication. So as soon as those wires melt and come together, they would historically have indicated an alarm but now with this confirmed temperature element, that's not enough. Once those wires touch, it sends a signal out to the wires to actually read the temperature where that short has occurred. If that temperature is still considered ambient or within the realm of uh, normal operation as programmed, it will not go into alarm. It'll just go into a fault because maybe a fork truck or uh, a box was put up somewhere and it actually pinched the wire. So there's not a heat increase there, but the wires have touched. So it's more of a, sh a wire short or a trouble condition versus an actual alarm from a fire. But at the same time, when it sends that signal out to confirm the temperature, if it sees that, hey, my wire was set at 150 degrees and I'm reading 150 degrees, 
So this is a fire. Now let's trigger an alarm. It's not just a trouble condition. It's an alarm. So it confirms the temperature and uh, sets the system into alarm. And so with that protective wire, uh, it can best be described as a continuous chain of individual spot heat detector because anywhere along that wire that that short of that temperature increases, uh, the system will respond to it and detect it. And you can see that we do have a wide range of uh, temperatures as well as uh, the outer jackets that allow it to put in, into some either extremely cold conditions or extremely harsh conditions with as far as uh, maybe some toxic or caustic chemicals being uh, in place there. So a lot of different types and temperature of wires we can use to accommodate just about any environment uh, that we want to detect in there with linear heat detection. So that really touches on just a real quick overview of some of the advancements or uh, different means of detection. And now uh, the, the shorter por portion of the, the uh, presentation here is we've detected, what are we going to do to notify people about it? Well, when, when it comes to control panels, we basically break them down into two types. You've either got addressable or single zone slash conventional type control panels. And Flight does have a very wide product line uh, for whatever size or complexity of the hazard we might have. Everywhere from a single zone conventional panel that's maybe just looking at up to 50 detectors in a small area or a relatively small complex uh, that can still release either a pre-action sprinkler system or a clean agent system. Uh, we've got our Cheetah XI addressable panel for releasing across multiple zones. Uh, and you're talking 250 plus zones that we can program into this to monitor much larger and complex areas and sites and facilities. And then our fire control panel product line at the bottom there, which is for building fire alarm. And those building fire alarm panels uh, are different in size, but capable of just of addressing just about any size site, any number of buildings. Uh, they're very networkable together so that regardless of what size the facility or site is, we can link together and program in whatever it takes from the form of just the detection and enunciation, emergency responder systems, emergency communication systems, mass notification, voice evac, uh, we can do whatever is needed to to meet the requirements of any jurisdiction's fire codes from a fire alarm system standpoint and choosing the right panel or combination of different panels, linking everything to get together to give you a very complete system and integrated system from a fire alarm standpoint. So very capable. We've got all the product lines to accomplish whatever is going to be needed uh, when it comes to any specific sites fire alarm system. But now the neatest part of the presentation and what really is the backbone of our product offerings are when it comes to we've detected something, we've notified, now what are we going to do to react? And your basic uh, options for reaction are just wait for the professionals to come, wait for the local responders to come with their hoses or extinguishers to put the fire out. Uh, just wait for the sprinkler system to potentially dump water in and around the facility to control it or actively look to cleanly extinguish and control the fire uh, before that additional secondary and collateral damage occurs. And again, this is where fight comes in. And through our broad product offering of clean extinguishing agents, which are defined in NFPA 2001, standard on clean agent fire extinguishing systems, it basically can best be described as anything you're using to put out a fire that is odorless, colorless, non-toxic or safe for exposure, and does not leave any trace left behind. So no residue, no film, no dirt or dust to clean up or wipe up afterwards considers or falls into the definition of a clean extinguishing agent. Clean extinguishing agents have been around for a very long time and are very popular and have always been the most preferred choice for fire extinguishing and fire protection, especially in mission critical uh, protection areas uh, with, where the primary goals of a system are to protect the assets, minimize downtime, again being very safe for people that are going to be in the room because a lot of these areas are normally occupied and occupiable non-conductive electricity, and again, no residue left behind, uh, very space efficient, and they provide three-dimensional firefighting. So dis, uh, discharging as a gas in the room, it'll get in and around any obstructions, any small open passageways inside cabinets, uh, server racks, wherever that smoldering or fire event may occur, by discharging gas in the room, it's gonna fill every potential uh, cubic foot of volume that it can find and get to uh, very efficiently with the goal being extinguishing extremely quickly and getting yourself back to business and staying up and running uh, as quickly as possible. The original agent for clean extinguishing systems was Halon 1301, 
Uh, Halon 1301 was very popular for many years, but ultimately in 1994, uh, it was determined and, and evaluated to be a severe contributor to ozone depletion. So it was basically banned from production back in the mid 90s to a point where it could no longer be sold for new systems and it could only be used to recharge existing systems that might have discharged. And with that said, even though that all took place back in the mid 90s, there are still thousands of systems actively in service throughout the world. Uh, and many systems that do discharge and there's still plenty of agent out there to recharge your systems with. The only caveat is we cannot design or alter any Halon 1301 systems uh, at this point. So anytime an existing system changes, it's got to be replaced with a more present day accepted agent. Uh, and we can't just redesign a Halon 1301 system. But if you do have a customer or a room where you have a Halon system and it activates, we can certainly recharge it. But a lot of folks, a lot of corporations are actively looking to uh, proactively replace their systems uh, just because of corporate mandates or environmental uh, initiatives to try to stay greener and more environmentally friendly. And so the present day options that are most typically uh, mentioned in FP2001 today are listed here on the screen. Your most popular Halon 1301 replacements are Icaro 25 and Pro Inert. Uh, primarily because they are the ones that are most likely to be able to utilize some, if not all, of the existing piping from a Halon 1301 system for those other agents there on the screen will not be able to. You have to remove the tank, the piping, the nozzles, everything from Halon 1301 and redesign new, but those two that are circled may in fact be able to utilize most of the existing uh, piping there around its system so you can save on some installation uh, fees and practicality to convert a system over. The fight clean agent systems that are the most popular are the Icaro 25, FM 200, and 3M Novec 1230. All three of those uh, and why people use them is because all three of those are completely safe for occupied areas, are fully listed and approved with everybody that needs to uh, approve any of this stuff. They've all, uh, they're all very sustainable. They're all certified and have very low global warming potential and zero ozone depleting potential with relatively short atmospheric lifetimes. And again, they all fall under that category being odorless, colorless, and no residue left behind. Now, very recently, some of the landscape has changed in regards to the clean agents that are uh, the most popular and in demand because of the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act that was recently passed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And it actually originated many years ago uh, but was just passed into legislation back in December of 2020 and became effective January 1st of this past year. So January 1st, 2022 is when the restrictions or the phase down uh, schedule started for any HFC products. And when we talk about FM200 and Icaro 25, they are considered HFC products. And even though they've been relatively ignored uh, for the past many years as all these environmental discussions and, and focus took place or, or they're recognized that when they are reduced to the atmosphere they're actually doing more good than they are harm because they're actively putting out a fire ultimately uh, they are still hfcs and the aim act was put in very blandly to say anything that's an hfc regardless of what it is or how good it is or or its benefits if it's still considered an hfc it's going to be part of the phase down schedule we're now looking to implement uh, but it's important to note that this is a phase down schedule and not a phase out. So HFCs are going to continue to be manufactured and imported in the US, United States for many years. Uh, but again, Novec 1230 now alternately is not an HFC. It's a fluoroketone. So if we look at some of the agent comparisons here just from an environmental standpoint, uh, standpoint you can see where uh, you know Halon, the biggest thing that ruled out Halon 1301 was up there in the top right, very heavy on the ozone depletion where none of the other agents on there have that ozone depletion. The global warming potential was very high for Halon, but basically cut in half for the HFC products being FM200 and Icaro. But you can see where Novec 1230 is very low on the global warming potential scale. And that's why, especially as an FK or a fluoroketone product, uh, it is not subject or target to any environmental regulations at this time, whereas the HFCs are going to be a little bit more reduced in as far as their availability here moving forward. What a clean agent system looks like when it discharges. Uh, this is obviously an old computer room, uh, but it's, the effects of the discharge are going to be pretty consistent here uh, yet today. And let's see if we can get this to play.
Look, I'm having a little bit of trouble here with my video. But this video is just going to show you a clean agent system discharging. And ultimately what happens is it just fills the room with a white fog. So while the agent itself is not hazardous or toxic for anybody that might be in the room, one of the main reasons we ask or recommend for everybody to leave the room before the system goes off is because as soon as you open a door, the agent is going to leak out and now you've reduced your concentration and your design effectiveness of the system. But it's also going to be very hard to see your way across the room because there is going to be an initial fog just because of the temperature differential uh, that the agent is introducing to make it more difficult to see a clear and safe passageway uh, to the exit. So I apologize that the video is not playing for some reason there. Uh, but that's just to give me an idea of how those clean agent systems work and why they're so popular. Another option from a clean agent standpoint is inert gas systems. So the FIKE Pro inert system is an inert gas fire extinguishing system and where the chemical agents reduce or extinguish a fire by a chemical reaction and heat absorption, inert gas systems extinguish by oxygen reduction. So it's again, it's not oxygen displacement like with CO2, carbon dioxide systems are complete oxygen displacement. So you do not want to be in an area or a room that has a CO2 system because you will not be able to breathe. But with a pro inert system, it looks to use a combination of primarily argon and nitrogen to reduce the oxygen in the area to below areas where a fire can continue to burn, but to keep them above limits and uh, minimal uh, balances of oxygen to where it's still safe for human occupants inside the room. So if we look at what that really means, you know, on the left hand side there is the typical air that we breathe right now. You know, a trace amount of argon, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a little bit of trace amount of CO2. And when we introduce the inert gas system into the mix, we're ultimately just increasing the amount of argon, reducing the nitrogen a little bit, but taking that oxygen level down to about 12.5%, which is right about the minimum that a, a, a fuel that cannot generate its own oxygen needs about 12.5% oxygen in the air to continue to be able to sustain combustion. So as soon as we get down to about that 12 and a half percent, the fire is extinguished, but there's still well enough oxygen in the area. Uh, I think humans first start to really feel adverse effects from oxygen displacement down around 8 percent is where you might be able to start uh, expecting blurred vision, dizziness, nauseous, that kind of thing. So being at 12 and a half percent is basically just uh, the equivalent of what your body feels like when it's in some very high elevations like in Denver, Colorado or on Pikes Peak. Uh, hiking into some higher mountains. That's about the effect of being an inert gas system. You, your body just has to work a little bit harder to get that oxygen out of the air, but you don't really feel any other adverse effects. And of course, carbon dioxide systems, CO2, still have a very wide range of, of applicability. Uh, they're very rapid to perform because they are complete oxygen displacement wherever those nozzles are aimed. Uh, they are still environmentally friendly because it's a naturally occurring uh, element in the atmosphere, but again, they're they're very detrimental for human occupants that might be uh, nearby if a system ever goes off. So where we mostly see carbon dioxide systems being used are in some very heavily industrial type applications uh, where they're not likely to have somebody either in that specific area or inside that room uh, when a fire is expected to occur and a system to go off. Uh, so we only, only will really recommend or use them in normally unoccupied spaces. And there are still some definite safety features that need to be built onto that system uh, to be able to ensure that if somebody is in the area, they know that that CO2 system is about to go off so they can make it to somewhere safe uh, before they're inadvertently exposed to those higher levels of carbon dioxide. One of the other newer and uh, more popular and increasing popularity products is water mist. So water mist uh, is, where, is what we define a system that uses very fine water spray droplets, less than a thousand micron in droplet size is what designates something for water mist. Water mist can be used in class A, B, and C hazards. Uh, they've been, there's been water mist systems around for a very long time, uh, but what held the, it back from popularity was just the cost and complexity of those early systems because they all relied on very high pressure to uh, to get to very small droplet sizes and when you when in order to get to that high pressure and that very small droplet you need a lot of high pressure gases you need a very controlled quality water source uh, that's free of contaminants to not block up any of the pipes or the nozzles and then of course you need very high pressure pipe and fittings uh, and they were very complex and expensive to uh, supply and install and design 
which ultimately led to water mist not really ever becoming very popular uh, just because of, of some of the difficulty in working with it. If we look at a video here, if this one plays, we've got a water mist nozzle up in the main screen versus a traditional sprinkler nozzle or a sprinkler head down in the right hand corner of the screen there. So you can see when that mist sprays off, uh, you can see it floating around and it looks like a cloud inside the room there. So it does almost act and behave like a gas when it discharges. And because of that, it will be very quick to put out a fire. And when we discharge it as a mist, we use a lot less water than a traditional sprinkler system. Traditional sprinkler heads might be designed or, or expected to put about, put out about 25 gallons per minute, whereas our water mist systems are going to be at least half and in some cases much less than that of clean water because we're hooking into the domestic or potable water supply at the site. So the same water you would drink with or use to clean up the facility is the water we're going to discharge to extinguish a fire. And this video here will show you just how quickly one mist nozzle overhead will knock down and extinguish uh, this large Class A fire. So before the cloud or the mist actually even seems to reach the fire, the flame is knocked down uh, and extinguished very quickly. And you can see the mist just kind of, some of it floats out the open doorway, but most of it just stays in the, uh, entrained in the air inside the space that fire will Water mist uh, becoming much more popular with a wider range of uses, uh, everything from light hazard systems. So in our light hazard listing, it, it's very similar to a sprinkler system. It's a wet pipe system with every head being closed. And once that head melts off at 135 degrees, it sprays out water. But, but instead of spraying out the large amounts of large droplet sprinkler system, it comes out as a mist. So it leaves a lot less collateral damage behind. Uh, surfaces and floors are always going to get wet anytime you're dealing with water, but with a mist system, uh, they're going to be wet but not saturated, and you'll be able to clean up with basically a, a towel uh, or a light mop versus buckets and squeegees because of the sheer amount of water that you would have there uh, with the flooding factor of a sprinkler system. So very popular in uh, light hazard occupancies where people are very concerned about collateral damage after an activation, and in total flood systems for generator uh, transformer vaults, uh, generator enclosures, turbines, uh, large heavily industrial equipment becoming much more prone to, to preferring water mist systems, as well as we do have a listing for data centers. So now uh, in data centers is where they, uh, our users would typically rely on some of those early warning systems we talked about before and clean agents to eliminate the collateral damage. But even when they do that, a lot of times they still need to have a sprinkler system as an all as a fail safe backup and so now if they have to have that sprinkler system regardless we can give them an option to say well you have to have water regardless so now how about if it if it ever has to discharge in there let's have it be a mist instead of a sprinkler system so it can quickly extinguish and do a heck of a lot less collateral damage and it's a very easy uh sale and understanding as to what the benefits are to have mist and we are now listed for pre-action systems, even designed as a pre-action dry pipe system as well. We'll skip over some of these slides here in the uh, recognition of time. Uh, one of the other products I wanted to touch on was uh, that FIKE has available is an EPO or an emergency power shutdown management system that we market as our EPSMS systems. So in a lot of cases, especially in your mission critical facilities, power shutdown in a fire event is very important because you want to remove that source of the uh, electrical feed to that equipment that may have triggered your activation here. And a lot of times the EPO wiring, which is obviously extremely critical uh, for those areas, is not very documented. You know, here's an example of something that might be considered highly documented just because somebody actually took the time to kind of sketch out on the cover box of that electrical box there what's tied into what and uh, how things are wire nutted together. But still, that would make somebody very nervous to take that cover off and to try to either bypass something or add something to it because the last thing anybody wants is their lights to go out and their servers to go down in a computer room because somebody inadvertently tripped the EPO system or circuit. So what we do is we engineer the emergency power off system so that everything is very labeled, wired, uh, disableable uh, to bypass for maintenance and is supervised. And with that, with providing all of that uh, documentation and schematics, every there should be no guesswork as to what's inputting into the signal uh, into the system, whether it's a fire panel or an EPO switch somewhere on the wall. And it should be no secret what's connected to it as far as your power equipment, servers, 
uh, fire dampers or HVAC units uh, and everything. So we can do this either on a new system. We work with a lot of engineers to design the electrical systems that go into these rooms. Or if somebody has an existing room and they just don't know what is tied into what, uh, we can develop them a system to make sure everything is documented and to eliminate that guesswork. And then one of the newest products that we have a partnership with comes to bi-directional amplifiers and emergency responder communication systems. And basically, even though there's a lot of new terminology here and different parts and pieces to it, uh, the, the best way to say it is that it's a, a signal amplifier, a signal booster system. Uh, they're code compliant and code required just about everywhere. So it's a lot of stuff that gets uh, missed or lost in the shuffle is that anytime you have a building uh, that has occupants in it and a fire alarm system, you need to make sure that the first responders that enter that building, when they key their radios to talk to home base or the other uh, first responders out at the trucks, whether it's fire trucks or EMS trucks, you've got to make sure that there's somebody there on the other end and that they can clearly hear what's going on and clearly have connection and communication with the guys that are inside. And that's where these BDA systems and these uh, signal booster systems come in. Uh, they're very unique and interesting, but very simple. It's just a network of coax cable mostly from a, a donor antenna getting the signal from the base and then a booster system on the inside that distributes it through distributor uh, antennas inside the space. With the ultimate key being, uh, and something that we map out here is we can walk through a, a site with a radio and key it and see exactly what the signal loss is at every corner, desk, window, uh, area, room of that facility, and then design a system and put antennas where they're needed to make sure they don't lose more than the allowable signal to make sure that there's clear and uninterrupted signal communication back to the base from any first responder. So that's a very popular system uh, that we've been doing a lot of work with here as well lately too. So. In closing, from a fike standpoint, you know, what we typically ask our customers is, is if you're looking for protection from fires without collateral damage or complete campus system integration or a trusted partner to offer consultation and solutions that will be catered to your needs, whatever they are, with regards to emergency response or fire detection and extinguishing. We encourage you to think about fike first because that's what we're here for. We've built our, our company and our reputation and our distribution network to support and educate. And uh, that's what we're here to do. So that's what I had here for you for the presentation today. So hopefully I didn't run too far over time and uh, covered everything to give you at least a little bit of taste as to what we have. And so with that, Taylor, uh, if you saw any questions come in or we want to address anything additional, I'd be happy to do so. So thank you again for your time. Yeah, um, I do not see any questions in the chat. Um, just before we kind of close out here, I just want to give, I know, um, we had a couple of people join us late. Does anybody have any questions for Rick while we have him here on the line? You can either hop on your mic and ask or drop it in the chat and I can ask for you. I know that was a lot of information, a lot of things that I learned. Um, so like I said earlier, we I did record this presentation. Um, so I will follow up with all of our customers that have joined us with a um, link to the recording a link to some more information on the FIKE website, and then that'll give you time to kind of digest things. And if you need further information, I will be happy to connect you with your IPS account rep, and we will get you taken care of. So if there are no questions, I think we can close and let everyone get on with their day. Thank you again for joining us. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.